claims aren't evidence. Are you sure about that? Hey, welcome back to the channel. So let's get into this, right? Claims are not evidence. Hmm, really? So when I was an atheist, I wasn't real big on trying to make this argument, but I've noticed a lot of atheists are trying to make this argument, and especially in a lot of YouTube channels that have gotten real popular, Dillahunty as an example. And so I've noticed that this is essentially being used as a tactic to try to essentially dismiss the legitimacy of the New Testament by stating that, well, that's just a bunch of claims that people said, it's not evidence of anything. And we really need to dive into this to understand, is this accurate? Because ironically, the statement in and of itself is a truth claim. So is this a valid argument? Well, let's start by understanding what a claim is, right? So there's a couple definitions here from Ream Webster. But the one we wanna focus on is a claim is an assertion, right? But not just an assertion, an assertion open to challenge. And here's what we want to focus on. Because things that people say, you could definitely say are our assertions. And they're subject to scrutiny, especially when they're done in the public square. So then let's get into whether or not an assertion is evidence, right? So what is evidence, right? Well, an outward sign, an indication of something, something that furnishes proof, for example, testimony and also one who bears witness. So in these contexts, we have absolute confirmation in the Bible that that's exactly what these people were doing. And I mean, the words testimony and witness is found many, many times in the Bible. And definitely if we think in today's modern world, right? In a, in a courtroom, what a witness says when they're testifying in court is considered evidence. So witness testimony is evidence. So let's also think about this in terms of the first century, right? These people were willing to go in public and bear witness to the first account knowledge they had with respect to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And they were making this testimony in a theocracy where they would have to answer to the Jewish government, which we know as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? The, the courts of the Jewish system. And so this is not something to be taken lightly. It's We can't really think about it in terms of the 21st century where people can make allegations and claims and and slander people in public and nobody really holds people accountable anymore. but. We're talking about a period of time where there was real consequences. This was a theocracy. I mean, for example, right, if we look at Matthew, it talks about things not to do, right? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. And also in the book of Mark, right, talking about the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. So. We're talking about the Jews and how seriously they took their laws. And so the apostles and the disciples of Christ, when they were stating that they were firsthand witnesses to his ministry, those are testimony. That is evidence. And so, for example, you've got John, one of the 12, right? quoting Jesus here, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. In Acts, right? Jesus, God raised up and all that we all are witnesses. Again, in Acts, uh, this is quoting Peter, one of the apostles. He's talking to the, the Jews themselves saying, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. So to say that they're just making claims is nonsense. You know, these people are in the public stating that they are witnesses to these events, not just Jesus's ministry, but to his 
resurrection after death. And these are not third party accounts. This is not hearsay. This is John stating this in his gospel and also in his epistles. You've got Acts, which is chronicling a lot of Peter's early ministry. But you even have other examples here again in the book of John. John ends his gospel by stating that he is the disciple who bore witness to all of these things that he wrote about. So it is a firsthand account chronicling the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. From one of John's letters, 3 John 12, stating that his testimony is true. First Peter, stating that he was a witness to the sufferings of Christ. So again, we're talking about evidence in the form of eyewitness testimony. And then there's Paul's letter to the Corinthians, which is probably the most famous for the different name drops that he does here. You know, he starts by saying that Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the 12, the 12 being the core disciples. Then he makes the bold claim here that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people, many of whom are still alive. And then he also mentions that Jesus also appeared to James, in this case, the brother of Jesus, then to all the apostles. In this context, the apostles is not the 12. It is the, the greater core group of folks that follow Jesus' ministry. And then lastly, he names himself. So again, he's bearing witness here. And we have to understand that Paul's letter carries substantial weight because it's being read in a church and remember, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were chomping at the bit to squash this movement. And it's naive to think that they wouldn't take an opportunity to catch Paul in a lie because Paul used to be a Pharisee and then he converted. So to them, he's a traitor. And again, this is a theocracy where slander, lying, and bearing false witness can have a penalty of being stoned to death. So you cannot take that lightly. So it is reasonable to conclude that he is telling the truth. It is unreasonable and irrational to believe that these people were all just making up claims and telling lies. When we think about it in a modern context, right? People don't just assume what reporters are writing in the paper is quote claims. They call it journalism. So we need to apply the lens properly when we're thinking about the New Testament. So the question isn't really whether or not these are claims that you can just simply dismiss that they aren't quote unquote evidence. What you really have to decide for yourself is whether or not the writers of the New Testament are telling the truth or not. And that's maybe a topic for another day, but there's very good evidence to indicate strongly that they were telling the truth. I mean, why would they lie when they're in a theocracy where their lies could condemn them to death? Matter of fact, many of them were martyred for their convictions about the truth of what they bore witness to. So it's actually irrational to think that they had motive to lie all the way to the point of suffering and dying for it. That perspective is what bears the burden of proof. So in closing, when you really do a better analysis, you find that this argument claims are not evidence is a fallacious argument. It's very weak. So the verdict on this thing is that it's a false argument. That's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. God bless you.